Thank you for joining us. This session is to discuss the graduate program in the Department of Robotics offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. My name is Ayana Teal. I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Marketing for the Whiting School of Engineering. We will begin this session with a brief overview of Johns Hopkins University. Then to provide you with a program overview and give you an opportunity to get answers to your questions, we will have Professor, former Chair of the Mechanical Engineering Department and the Director of Education for Robotics, Professor Lewis Whitcomb join us. Lewis is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, is renowned for innovative robotics research and development for space, underwater, and other extreme environments, as well as novel systems for medicine and industry. He holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Computer Science. Also joining us will be Emily Yang. Emily is a second year master's student currently, currently researching needle shape sensing for medical robotics. Also joining us will be Allison Morrow. Allison is the academic program administrator of the robotics department. Today, we will discuss engineering at Hopkins, an overview of the robotics program, the admissions process, including some important dates, specific research areas, graduate student life, and finally, a live question and answer session. You can type any questions you have in the live chat at any time, and we will address those at the end of the formal presentation. Johns Hopkins University was the nation's first research university founded for the express purpose of putting discovery and knowledge to work for the good of humanity. Today, we are a top tier university and remain committed to academic excellence and pioneering research. For the past 38 years, Hopkins has led the US higher education in research and development, spending a record $2.43 billion in fiscal year 2016, and this amount increases every year. The Whiting School of Engineering is home to 11 graduate programs and more than 25 research centers and institutes. Because our research is interdisciplinary, our, fa our faculty work closely with the eight other divisions, including School of Medicine, Applied Physics Laboratory, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our expertise includes medicine and engineering, defense, information engineering, resilient systems, and many more. It is the mission of the Whiting School to provide its students with an outstanding engineering education that is innovative, rigorous, and relevant, and prepares its graduates to be 21st century leaders. Some of the career resources available to our students include the Life Design Lab, where there are counselors specifically dedicated to graduate students, employer and alumni networking events, and resources for entrepreneurship. Now I will hand it over to Dr. Whitcomb, who will detail the robotics program. So welcome everybody. Um, um, my name is Lewis Whitcomb. Um, I'm one of the faculty members who helped create the uh, robotics MSc uh, some years ago, and it's a, been a great pleasure to, uh, to see the program grow. Um, the uh, robotics MSc is, is run out of the Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics. This is the robotics uh, research and teaching epicenter uh, at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, some of the area, some of the are areas that we uh, conduct research in and teach courses in include medical robotics, robots in extreme environments, bio-inspired robotics, and human-machine collaborative systems. Our center uh, has about five million dollars a year in externally sponsored research, and our footprint is that we have about twenty uh, robotics engineering faculty from several different departments including mechanical engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, and biomedical engineering. And we have 10 to 15 postdocs. Right now we've got about 70 uh, master's students and we've got about 70 PhD students. So it's a fairly large operation and it's quite vibrant. So the MSc program requirements uh, are shown in this slide and I'll quickly review them. Most MSc students uh, complete their degree requirements in one and a half to two years. Uh, and uh, there's two ways that you can complete the degree requirements. One way is to take uh, 10, 10 courses, a significant number of which I think six need to be at the graduate level. These uh, courses can be from uh, a variety of departments, including the engineering departments that I've mentioned, and also other departments such as applied math or mathematics, uh, even physics. Um, so you have a wide range of courses to choose from. The, uh, so you complete uh, 10 courses um, that satisfies the degree requirements, and there's uh, different tracks um, that you can concentrate in. Uh, another option is to do a master's thesis, which at Johns Hopkins is called an essay. And in this option, you complete uh, eight courses um, and uh, conduct independent research with a faculty member and write a master's thesis uh, essay, which is kind of 
uh, basically like an extended research uh, monograph. Um, we have a variety of tracks um, in the robotics MSE, uh, including a focus in automation science and engineering, uh, a track with focus in biorobotics, uh, a track with focus in control and dynamical systems, one in medical robotics, and one in perception and cognitive systems. And we also have a, we recently created a track in general robotics. The, um, oh, I should mention that um, in all of these tracks, there are two core courses that all robotics master students take to graduate courses, and you can take them in any order, normally in your first year. Uh, one is, is primarily, it's called uh, Robot Devices, Kinematics and Control, uh, and that's primarily focused on the mathematics uh, and physics of robots. And the second uh, required course for all robotics master students is Algorithms for Sensor-Based Robotics, and that's uh, primarily focused on the algorithms for navigating robots through, through our world, um, and it involves a significant amount of programming and math. Uh, so admissions, the admissions deadline, Allison will correct me, I believe is December 15th correct. Um, for the master's program. Um, and our students who are admitted to their program typically have an average GPA of 3.5 or above out of four and average GRE scores of verbal of 150 or above and quantitative 161 or above. The language of our program uh, that we teach in our program is English. Um, so uh, we expect a, a TOEFL score of 100 uh, or greater. As I mentioned a moment ago, the deadline for applications for admissions for the fall 2020 uh, semester is uh, December 15th. And uh, what you need to do is uh, prepare an online application, which includes a statement of purpose. And you need to reach out to three of your mentors uh, to get letters of recommendation. Uh, and in order to get letters of recommendation, who do you, who do you ask for letters of recommendation? Uh, candidates would include uh, faculty members with whom you've taken courses. Uh, faculty members with whom you've done projects, either research projects or other kinds of projects uh, in their laboratory, or if you've done internships uh, in, in companies, then oftentimes the person that you reported to in the company would be able to provide a letter of recommendation. What's most important is that the person is, is, uh, has personal knowledge of your engineering abilities. You know, when, when you reach out to ask people, uh, the, rules, the rules you need to follow is don't ask at the last minute. So one week ahead of the deadline is, is too soon. Make sure you ask a minimum of four weeks ahead of the deadline. And what you want to provide uh, your letter writers with is a resume, a copy of your transcript, and a statement of purpose. And very importantly, you want to provide them with a spreadsheet of the programs that you're applying to uh, with names of the programs uh, and the deadlines for each one of them, because not they'll, they'll all have slightly different deadlines. And, and give your, uh, uh, your letter writers uh, four weeks uh, advance notice so that they can get their letters uh, in by the deadline. In addition, you need to um, uh, uh, you need to designate that the your GRE and TOEFL scores are distributed to Johns Hopkins, as well as uh, your previous institution. You need to uh, request that they send transcripts to Hopkins, so that will become part of your file. So those can be unofficial transcripts. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Just to repeat that, those can be unofficial transcripts. They do not need to be official transcripts when you apply. If you are accepted, we'll ask for official transcripts then. Yeah. Great. And uh, Allison uh, Morrow will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Normally, um, uh, we review the applications um, uh, starting uh, in early to mid-January, um, and decisions are released uh, to uh, admitted students uh, in mid-February. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> I should say, we switched to an, a new application online system last year, and it went OK. Um, <laughs> and so we anticipate that it will go smoothly this, this year, or at least we're, we're hoping that it will. We've got our fingers crossed. All right, let me, let me uh, tell you a little bit about research, um, uh, some of the research that goes on here at Hopkins. Uh, a, a longer list of the areas that we conduct research in um, includes medical robotics, uh, robotics in extreme environments, biorobotics, human machine collaborative systems, modeling, dynamics, navigation and control, and perception and cognitive systems. And so you can see that our research areas are closely aligned with the tracks in the MSC program. And I'll say a few, I won't cover all of these, but I'll say a few, uh, I'll say a few things one of the things that we're known most for, we're probably uh, have the number one medical robotics uh, program in the world. Uh, and um, uh, the number one medical robotics researcher uh, in the world is Russ Taylor, who's the director of uh, our laboratory. Uh, and we have a number of researchers in computer science, Peter Cassensides, Russ Taylor, uh, Greg Hager, and in mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering, Julian Yodopitsa, uh, Mehran Armand, uh, and others who are working in the area of medical robotics. Uh, robotics in extreme environment um, environments, uh, that's something that I do. Um, so uh, I work on dynamics and navigation and control for underwater vehicles for oceanographic exploration. 
Uh, this is a picture that I took uh, deploying when we were deploying an underwater robot north of Greenland in the Arctic Sea in uh, 2014. We were at 86 degrees north, uh, 6 degrees west, west. You can look that up on a map. It's about 200 kilometers northeast of Greenland. Uh, and we were using this robot to, uh, to map out the distribution of uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton in the upper water column on, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in pack ice in the Fram Strait. And uh, the uh, other uh, faculty members who were involved in robotics in extreme environments include uh, Peter Kassensidis in computer science. Uh, we have a project together in, in robots in telerobotics for on-orbit servicing of satellite, satellites, and Mehran, uh, sorry, um, Marin Kabilarov, who works on uh, path planning and control of aerial uh, and land uh, and surface vehicles. Mm -hmm. Another area that we're uh, very active in is in bio-inspired robotics. Uh, and this image is of an artificial, uh, essentially an artificial cockroach that uh, some students uh, who work in Chen Li's laboratory have developed. And they're trying to understand how insects, some insects like cockroaches, when they're flipped over on their back, they can actually right themselves and get themselves back on their feet. Um, and uh, they do this without having special purpose appendages. They use their, their feet and their, and their wings in order to right themselves. And so uh, they've studied uh, actual uh, cockroaches in the laboratory, and uh, they think they understand uh, how they do this writing motion, and so they built a, a robot to test out their theories to see if the if the robot they construct that's bio-inspired will do the right thing. Other faculty members who work in bio-inspired robotics uh, include Noah Cowan, uh, who is trying to understand uh, how how insects and animals use their uh, senses in order to control their motion, uh, and uh, they both do experiments with with animals and insects, and they also build robots once they understand the theory on how insects actually navigate through the world. They build robots based upon those theories and test them out. Uh, human machine systems. Um, so we've got a number of uh, faculty members who are working on human machine systems, um, including uh, probably our leading uh, researcher is uh, Jeremy Brown, uh, who works on haptics. So that's the how do you make a robot that has a physical interface that you can interact with, uh, with your arms or hands or feet. Um, and in computer science, we have Chen Ming Huang, uh, who is an expert on, on uh, human computer interaction. Uh, and, and, and really, since uh, a great variety of our robotic systems are telerobotic, they're remotely controlled by a human operator, I'd say that, that uh, probably over half of us are involved in human machine systems in one form or another. Uh, and Emily, will, will, in a moment, will say a little bit about the research that she's been doing um, uh, to develop a uh, surgical robot uh, that can take biopsies deep inside the human body, but it's remotely controlled by a surgeon. Thank you for that. Um, and so I'm going to briefly talk about the student experience. And then, of course, we can get um, Emily to talk a little bit about her personal student experience. Um, some of the, I'm going to skip around a little bit. Our graduate student organizations, there is a great sense of community here at Hopkins and something for you to join. We have the Graduate Queer Straight Alliance. GROW, which is our premier graduate representative organization. We have mentoring programs, mentoring to inspire diversity in science, the Black Grad Student Association, Women of Whiting, Chinese Students Association, Indian Graduate Student Association, um, and many, many others. We love Baltimore. Of course, when choosing a graduate program, you're also choosing a city to live in for two to five years, depending on your program. Baltimore is a city with a rich history as a working class port and has blossomed into a hub of social, cultural, and economic activity, but retains the small town feel that has earned it the nickname Charm City. And I have listed on this slide, some of the things that we're very proud of that you can see there. We were the got ranked number two food city in the US in 2015, which I feel like is the most important point on the slide. Now I'll hand it back over to Lewis, who will hand it back over to Emily to cover some of her experiences as a grad student here in the robotics program. So um, uh, this is Lewis Wickham again. Uh, so Emily Yang is my awesome uh, robotics advisee. I'm her academic advisor. Uh, she also has a research advisor uh, uh, who's uh, advising her in her uh, laboratory research. Um, so Emily, would you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, where did you go to school? What did you study? What, what did you do before coming here? What you're doing here and what you're going to do after you graduate? Sure. Okay. So hi, everybody. My name is Emily. Um, so I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering at MIT. And then after graduating from undergrad, I worked for a few years at Boeing as a payloads design engineer for the 787. 
And then I decided I wanted to go back to graduate school. Can I just say that I think that's the coolest thing? <laughs> that, that you helped design the world's first composite commercial aircraft? Yeah, I got to do release some engineering on the Dash 10, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so in terms of when I was applying to graduate school and I was applying to different programs, I knew I wanted to take courses and do research in robotics specifically. And I felt like a traditional mechanical engineering graduate program would be a pretty safe option. But I thought that a program that was specifically geared towards robotics would be a much better opportunity to learn more about like specific elements in the field. And for someone with a background in mechanical engineering, I knew that computer science topics like computer vision and augmented reality were some of the aspects that I wanted to explore and supplement my current mechanical engineering knowledge. And currently, um, I'm actually doing research in MRI compatible robots. Um, we're working on a shape sensing needle for prop state biopsy. Because the tip of the needle is beveled, when you're inserting it in, it doesn't go straight. And so we're trying to figure out how to sense the shape in real time as it's being inserted into the patient. And in the past, I've also had the opportunity to do some research on iRobots um, for retinal microsurgery, um, specifically developing the force sensing tools that are used for the surgical procedures. Yeah. Oh, and in terms of where I want to go after I graduate, since I'm graduating soon, um, I'm planning on returning to industry, um, hopefully getting a job in either robotics or mechanical engineering. Good. And can you uh, uh, could you say a few things about some of the courses that you've taken? Sure. So I think that the core courses that Dr. Wickham mentioned, like RDKDC, Robot Devices, can the very long name, that one, and also Algorithms, they're both really good introductory courses to the robotics field, and they cover a lot of things that are foundational for all the other courses that you might take here at Hopkins. And I guess some of the cool courses that I got to take that I probably wouldn't have taken if I did a traditional mechanical engineering degree uh, last semester, I took augmented reality, and we got to develop a 3D Angry Birds game for HoloLens, which was really awesome. So, it was pretty cool. I saw yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Emily. Um, and uh, in the question and answer session that we'll have at the end um, of the session, which will be soon, uh, if you have any questions for any of us, or uh, any of us four, um, then please feel free to uh, type those in, and we'll get your questions um, at the end of the session. I'd like to say a little bit about um, uh, what our students do um, after uh, graduating. So uh, students who are studying uh, robotics as part of their PhD, um, they go on to a variety of different places. I'd say probably about 20, 25 percent of them go on to academic and faculty positions worldwide. Uh, and I'd say probably about uh, three quarters of the students on any given year uh, go into research positions, but they'll be at uh, either private or corporate research labs all over the world. Uh, and so we have students uh, in every medical robotics company uh, in the world that I'm aware of have our students in them. Um, every high-tech robotics company, including uh, uh, companies like Google, uh, Waymo, Zoox, uh, that are working on uh, different ways of bringing robotics into our society. One of my former PhD students is uh, the control systems lead at Amazon Prime Air. And uh, he can't tell me a thing about what they do because it's super top secret, um, but I, I know it's pretty cool. Our master's students, uh, I'd say that our master's students in robotics come into the program with one of two primary objectives. Either they want to use the master's program as a step to uh, doing the PhD, or they see the master's degree in robotics as a way to get advanced skill in robotics so that they can go out and, and practice in robotics, which sounds like uh, what Emily had in mind when she was choosing grad schools. Yep. Uh, and a, and a, I'd say probably uh, in any given class, maybe 10% or so, Allison will correct me, of our master's students uh, go on to pursuing the PhD here, but uh, an equal percentage uh, go on to pursuing the master's degree elsewhere. PhD. Uh, sorry, uh, pursuing the PhD elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything about that, Allison? Um, I think if we're going to talk about jobs, um, and I'm, I'm going to caution this with we haven't actually pulled our most recent class of graduates yet, because we usually try and give them about six months, which will be happening soon. Um, but prior to May's graduation, um, something about 90 to 95% of all of our students 
I mean, all of our students since the program began have gone into jobs that are in industry um, or have gone into a PhD program. Right. And, and, so, and so the vast majority of students uh, go on to either graduate work or, um, or, or working in companies where they're practicing the discipline of robotics. Where they're actually working in the area of robotics. So it's not just Zen training. Great. Thank you for that. That is the end of our formal presentation. And so now we will open the floor for questions. The first one is from Rohan, who was asking if there are any exceptions to the GRE test. Unfortunately, no. We require the GRE test for absolutely every single student. With the only access, there is one small exception. If you are currently um, a JHU student or an alumni. Great. How is the robotics MSc different from doing an MSc through MECI with a specialization in robotics? Uh, I'd say that the uh, you can do uh, you can study robotics by doing an MSc in mechanical engineering uh, or computer science um, or electrical engineering or 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 in the robotics MSc uh, and uh, depending on what courses you're interested in, you might actually be able to take the same set of courses um, and satisfy uh, either degree. Um, students uh, will self-select between the two programs, I think, uh, uh, depending on where they want to go in their future career. If students are interested in robotics, but they're also interested in other things, maybe they're interested in aerospace or fluids or, or mechanics and materials, by taking uh, a degree in mechanical engineering, they'll be able to uh, take as much robotics as they want, but also other courses. And if they have a degree in mechanical engineering, if they want to market themselves as an aerospace engineer or as a robotics engineer after they graduate, uh, then they can more broadly market themselves. Some students um, really want to focus on robotics. They know that robotics is super hot right now, um, and uh, and they uh, uh, would like to uh, very much focus focus in robotics. They want to brand themselves uh, as being as having a degree in robotics. So. Um, uh, I think that uh, both choices are valid, uh, and uh, it's really an individual decision on what what works best for you. Both in and and in order to compare the degree requirements and how it would affect what courses you can take, you, know, you should read the advising manual for each program, uh, which will give you the detailed requirements. Uh, so, for example, if you take the mechanical engineering master's program and concentrate on robotics, you're not actually required to sign up for the weekly robotics seminar. But if you if you're in the robotics MSc uh, program, we require you to come to our weekly uh, seminar at noon every Wednesday during the semester. So there are some differences. Great, thank you for that. The next question is referencing um, the GRE scores and admissions. So if you guys could talk a little bit about the admissions process and what's looked at. Sure, so um, admissions uh, to the robotics program uh, we can't actually sit here and tell you that this one element is going to be what determines whether or not you get into the program. We do look at your entire package, um, including tra uh, your transcripts, your, your GRE scores, particularly your quantitative GRE score, um, your, if you're an international student, your language scores, and your statement of purpose. And if you do choose to put in a personal statement, also do play an important role. Um, and finally, actually, we do read every single letter of recommendation that comes in and uh, those have made the difference depending on the package at times, so. Great, thank you for that, Allison. Mm -hmm. The next question from Rohan, is there any opportunity to do research in the use of robotics in the automobile industry? Um, I can answer that. Um, so I, I should say that if, that we don't, uh, at Hopkins, we do not have a, pro, a specific program in automotive engineering. So if you wanna do automotive engineering to the exclusion of all else, you can go to University of Michigan or Michigan State, uh, where they they have very large automotive engineering programs, which are great programs. That being said, the cutting edge of automotive research these days uh, involves intelligent autonomous systems, semi-autonomous systems, uh, perception, uh, machine learning, mathematical modeling, and those are all things that we cover in a great variety of courses. Um, and so, for example, if you're interested in uh, understanding how you can do path planning and control for a uh, an automotive or wheeled vehicle, then you should take uh, uh, Marin Kabilarov's uh, course in nonlinear planning and control in robotics, uh, which specifically addresses uh, those core technologies for for uh, modern uh, uh, automotive uh, research. Great, thank you for that. Jacob is asking, what character traits do you look for in people accepted to this program? Who wants to take that one? Character traits. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure I know exactly what this question is asking. Um, 
I know that we we have a very diverse population and we, we believe very strongly in the strength of different personalities and people from different places in the world um, and that uh, communication with each other is one of the ways that we all grow and develop more interest in technologies. In terms of I, I'm not, if you could elaborate on what you mean by character traits. Well, I, I can say a few things. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd say that um, we're, we're very interested in having students um, who uh, believe in the benefits of a diverse community, both in, in research and in social life. We're interested in uh, students who we believe uh, will be kind to each other um, and uh, generous and supportive of their fellow students. Uh, our students come from all over the world when they get here um, uh, for their first semester. It's oftentimes a big change for them. And having a supportive group of students that you're studying with uh, really uh, is very helpful. Uh, and you'll find in graduate school that you probably learn as much from your fellow students as you learn uh, from your professors in class because you'll study together, you'll problem solve together, you'll work on research together. Um, and we also look for uh, things like personal integrity, uh, doing the right thing, and working hard, and contributing to a sense of community. Great, thank you both for that. And if that doesn't answer the question you intended to ask, yes. please do elaborate. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. Len is say, asking, she's an international student, but taking an undergrad at a university in the US, and does she still need to take the TOEFL? If your degree is in a, uh, an English-speaking institution in the United States, um, the TOEFL will be waived. However, it is not always automatic. So. If you submit your application and it is still asking for the TOEFL to be submitted, please send me an email so I can fix it. Yes, and we will have Allison's. Um, I'll, I'll actually put that slide up.